Welcome to Readings 3. My name is Angie Sutton. I'm a geek journalist. Welcome to Rainbow Space Magic Con 4.0. Before our panelists introduce themselves, I'm going to go over a few logistics. You're welcome to use the chat to talk to each other and share recommendations in a respectful manner. If you'd like to submit a question to the panel, please put a question mark before the question so it's obvious for the tech person and panelists. There will be time for questions in the second half, but feel free to write them as you think of them. After the panel, the, the conversation can continue in the Discord. So without further ado, let's start with you, Storm. All right. Um, so my name is Storm Kaywood, she, her. Um, I write spec fic and especially sapphic science fiction romance. Um, I am going to be, I'm reading from my published work, Love and Low Gravity, which is a holiday novella set on a small space station and also um, with a chapter in Paris, uh, 200 years in the future. Um, it takes place between a mafia lawyer who is starting over as a shopkeeper on a space station and a middle school teacher on the space station. So we are, we are gonna be hearing a chapter here from um, Vivian's point of view, or a short chapter. So am I good to start? Okay. So. The street was dusty and Vivienne was glad to push open the door into the bar, Richard's retirement gig. He'd been there for nearly a year, but she hadn't found time to visit. Now though, she didn't know where else to go. It was a risk, but she trusted him. Maybe she was naive. He came out and kissed her on both cheeks. Ma chère, come to visit an old man, have you? She took in the smell of him, the solid feel of his shoulders. He held her at arm's length and examined her. Something is wrong. No, I, something is wrong. Tell me, Cherie. He poured her a glass of gin and they took a seat in the darkest corner. Over the sound of piano music, it all spilled out of her. Things were happening since he left, since his nephew took the helm. The headlines, sensational stories, wanting to believe it had nothing to do with her, knowing it did. I can't, I don't know what to do, Richard. There used to be a code. This, it's, I, what is it you want, my dear? She took a deep breath and met his eyes. I want out. Richard blew out his cigar smoke slowly. I don't know that you can leave and still live in Paris. Antoine, he, he didn't finish. He didn't have to. Vivienne saw what happened to people Antoine believed to disrespected him. If you are out of sight, he won't care. If I give him someone to replace you quickly who works well, I can convince him it is his idea that you leave. I promise you he will not retaliate, but it will be better for you if you're far away. Let me make some calls. You should go out now, see the marketplace. There's a lovely hotel across the street. You can stay there tonight. We can talk tomorrow. She met him for coffee the next morning. He raised his cup and began. I hear Mars is beautiful this time of year. Mars. Yes, far from Paris, a lovely place for a tired young lawyer to go get some rest. I spoke to Antoine. He decided you're no use to him anymore and he wants to employ someone fresh. He'd like to promote the man who's been running some of my interests back home. He said to tell you no hard feelings. He needed a change. Mars. Yes, I can arrange for your mama to join you later if you would like. I don't think she would like that. How soon? There's a transport leaving tomorrow. Give me your device. I will transfer over your visa and ticket, the address for a building that will give you an apartment, some money to get you started. Richard, I, I don't know what to say. He snorted and looked to the side, then finally met her gaze. You understand, I can't stop Antoine. He'll run things how he pleases, like I did. I knew this wasn't the life for you. I'm sorry. No, don't be. Go and start over. You can have a different future somewhere else. Your mother will be safe. I will make sure of it. It was Sunday morning. The shop was traditionally closed on Sundays. She was here. She tried taking some deep breaths and went to brew some coffee, but nothing soothed her. So she did the first stupid thing that came to mind. She called Ada to see if she wanted to meet for breakfast. Ada was waiting for her at the canteen, reading on her handheld and cradling the mug of coffee she'd bought. I've been up for hours and already ate, but coffee and conversation are good. Go ahead and get your breakfast. Vivian did and returned with her tray. After she sat, Ada asked, is everything okay? 
You seemed a bit flustered when you called. Yes, I suppose I did. I needed to get out of the apartment and see a friendly face, but I'm fine. Some weird dreams about leaving Earth, going to Mars. Why did you leave Earth? I had to get out of my job. Hmm. I imagine being a lawyer was intense. Yes. She wished she could tell her. Yes, it was. So I took the money I had saved and moved to Mars, and for a couple of years I did nothing. Nothing? Nothing worthwhile. I had enough money saved to live off of. I read a lot. Went for walks in Perimeter Park. I know it well. I went to Mars University, but I graduated in 64, so it would have been before you were there. I loved it. You could walk so much further than in Ceres. Every cylinder in Ceres City is really a small town. But the ice tube around Mars City was so big you could walk forever. And the light was amazing. It was colder than I'd ever experienced, and that was exciting too. I always wanted to run the whole perimeter, but never did manage it. Vivian smiled. I wish I'd seen it through your eyes. Not very impressive after Earth? I suppose it was, but no. To me, it didn't feel vast or particularly bright. The engineering was remarkable, though. I appreciated it, being able to go for a walk. I'd imagined all you could do on Mars or in space was run strapped into a treadmill. I liked the lower gravity on Mars. I was so light. Here, too. But I was never much of a runner. I only do it now on the treadmill to keep fit. Vivian remembered running for a moment, remembered full gravity and bounding against it. I was scared to try it on Mars, afraid I'd push off too hard and send myself sailing into the ice walls. Ada laughed. There's still enough gravity to keep you from doing that. Maybe, but it didn't feel right. On Earth, I loved running. Do you think you'll ever go back? I don't know. I have such a nice little store here and such enjoyable company. It must feel so claustrophobic. It feels cozy. Ada's smile was so warm. Vivian wanted to sink into that smile and stay forever. She shook herself, but impulsively asked, do you have plans today? I still feel rather lost here, and I would love it if you could show me some of the weekend things to do. Ada lit up. I'd love to. Have you been to the rec center? I know you've been to the gym. There's a basketball court too. Vivian laughed. So you can see exactly how clumsy low graph makes me? You really can't go that far jumping. It only feels like it. And if you lose control and fall, I'll catch you. She imagined it, letting herself run, jump, feel her body's power again. Sounds great. Awesome. Let me go home and change and meet me there in an hour. Yes. Ada headed out and left Vivian giddy. She worried that Ada, Ada had only had coffee, then reminded herself that Ada was an adult who could manage herself. It felt nice to worry about her, though. She put on her gym shorts and shoes and headed out the door early to get the lay of the land. She paused at the scanner, though she wasn't required to spend any time here. As a contractor, rather than an employee, the company wasn't bound to care about her health, but everyone had to be scanned going in. She looked to the left, to the weight room where she first saw Ada and smiled at the memory. Then she poked her head into the gym. It was empty, thank God. She did not want to humiliate herself in front of anyone else. It looked pretty standard. She stepped in, nicer than the playgrounds she shot hoops in growing up. The floor was some kind of material that felt springy under her feet. Um, she remembered asphalt courts, landing with a thud, skinned knees. She jumped up a meter and grinned. The basket looked to be its normal height. She went over to the bin and took out a basketball. Dribbling was about the same. She ran slowly across the court, dribbling as she went. So far, so good. She took a shot. Air ball. Okay, this would take some time, but Ada was probably on her way in. She went back into the hallway and caught sight of Ada as she scanned in. Hey, I cheated and checked out the court before. No fair. Oh, don't worry. I don't think I'll even dent your home court advantage. Ada looked so cute. Blue basketball shorts, grease, dimpled knees. A sleeveless shirt showed the outline of her sports bra, and her hair struggled to escape its braids. Knee socks. Oh God, she was wearing knee socks. Vivian wanted to kiss her. As she stood there starry-eyed, Ada ran over, knocked the ball away and drove to the basket. She sang a perfect layup, cheered and said, your ball and tossed it to her. Vivian shot from where she stood and missed again, but grabbed her rebound. Then she missed again and again. Finally, she shot and scored. Yes, ha, take that. 
Ada cheered and high-fived. Are we keeping score? Yes. One to one. Play till 10? Okay. Ada, unsurprisingly, won the first two games, but Vivienne insisted on one more. Looking at Ada's pink cheeks, the flush extending to her neck and upper chest, seeing her chest rise and fall with exertion, Vivian had won no matter what the score. She beat her on their third game. After basketball, Ada hit the showers at the gym, and Vivian walked home alone, buzzy with the thrill of sport and of Ada. Silly how smitten she was. And that is that for that chapter. So where do we go from here? What's the, how's the story progress? Well, unsurprisingly, they fall in love. Um, they go to a party for Martian New Year and Vivian forgets her, her phone basically at her shop and they go back and get caught in low, in the gravity being, going out on the station. All power but life support goes out in the gravity and they start to float and have to hold on to each other to stay in place and one thing leads to another. Um, Vivienne feels very conflicted about involving who, what she sees as a very innocent person into her past life and that that guilt and anxiety creates the, the, you know, the conflict that keeps them from the initial love at first sight leading to permanent love. But it's a romance, so it ends with a happy ever after. And then so. where, kind of talk a little bit about how you got the idea for this specific story and. Um, I was, te I am a high school teacher by day, but I was teaching middle school for a couple of years and COVID hit. And I was in a middle school that was very under-resourced and trying to like manage this crisis and, uh, you know, do everything new. And I, I love sci-fi. Um, and so I sort of got thinking, I wonder what this would be like to be doing this on a space station. I've written a lot of Star Trek fanfic. Um, that's kind of where I got started back into writing as an adult, um, Deep Space Nine. And so I, I and one of the things I always like with sci-fi is imagining what the regular people are doing, like while the, the leads are off saving the world and saving the planet, what are the teachers doing? What are the cooks doing? What are, you know, um, what's happening with ordinary people? So it started with that idea of, um, of a teacher in space. And then because I'm a huge Deep Space Nine fan, the person that I don't know if you've watched, but Garrick, Shady Past, starting over with a shop on the space station, you know, sort of, sort of gave me the idea for, um, for my other lead. And then from there, just following, um, your your classic romance um structure but in space that's that's kind of like the thing for my writing like i write almost like contemporary rom-coms contemporary romances but in space they're sort mm -hmm. of think like what if it were in space so yeah. cool uh if you have any questions feel free to put them in a chat unless you're gwen gwen you can verbally ask your questions since you're a co-host uh <laughs> um do you feel uh what's the hardest part of writing for you finding the time um finding the time and the mental and emotional energy um i have you know still a pretty demanding day job um that also gives me a lot of inspiration um but at the same time just how to how to get up in the morning and work a full day and come home and sit down at the computer and write and i'm, I'm doing the gcls writing academy right now which is phenomenal i love it um so that that helps because it's giving me the inspiration but then it's also like this feeling of like oh gosh there's so much to do so that's the biggest challenge okay and looks like there are no questions so let's head on over to gwen Gwen, if you'd hey like to introduce yourself and do your reading. Yeah. So my name is Gwen Talios. I tend to specialize in short stories. So like flash fiction, um, shorter, even shorter short stories to like 5,000 words is considered long for me. Um, I have a few story collections out. My next one is coming out in a few weeks. So it's called Fade Dreams and Other Schemes. They're all fantasy stories. Um, and because they're kind of short, I had two that I wanted to read for you today. Um, the first one is called Siren Screech. Above the sound of screams, 
fear from sailors and delight from your family. Above the sound of cracking wood, above the sound of waves and seagulls and the soft rattle of your chain and the rasp of your voice, above it all, you hear a faint shout. Stop, stop. You look around, your sisters, sorry, you stop looking around your little island and see a sailor. He's soaking wet, clinging to a rock. There's a cut above his forehead. And as you stare at him, a large wave splashes in his face, wiping away the trail of red. Stop, he pleads again, knowing he's gotten your attention. You stare at him, considering. Your singing is bad, you know this. It's bad because it's evil, luring ships to their doom. But it's also bad because it's never been a talent you fostered. And why would you? An awful voice can lure a ship to its doom just as well as a melodious one, sometimes quicker. The sound driving sailors mad and willing them to do anything to get the sound to stop. If they drown trying to get to the riches they think you have, or bash their skulls on the mast in madness, does it matter? It's blood and bodies, either way. But no one has survived before. No one has swum to your island, climbed the slick rocks, and looked at you. He pulls himself out of the water and starts staggering toward you. He doesn't seem to notice your condition, the dryness of your scales, the chapped nature of your lips. It rains too frequently for you to dry out, but you are as ugly as your voice. You open your mouth to, consider sing to continue singing. There are others still struggling in the waves. This sailor will feel the buzz of madness, the screech of pain in his ears. Please stop, he shouts, killing the sound in your throat. He's feet away, breathing heavily from pain and exhaustion, and there are tears in his eyes. Salt water drops to add to the sea. You're a seagull, an albatross. I have never heard something so horrid in my life. There's something off about the sound, an accent to his vowels, a slurring of the words. It's as if he doesn't know what speech sounds like, and you realize that's correct. The sailor is deaf. It's horrid, he repeats, crying and smiling. But I can hear it. It's also killing the crew, so please stop. Behind him, the last swimmer goes under, and you watch the ship split on the rocks. Ship fall. Behind your pod is below your pod is feasting, ripping legs apart and collecting treasure. If you're lucky, one of them will bring you the nibbled remains of an arm, maybe a broken toy to keep you company. You have 20 more years chained to this island. You can understand the human's language, but cannot speak it. Not with gills pressed flat against your neck, not with pointy teeth. You never sing human words, but they translate all the same because sirens speak to human hearts. So you sing to this one, just as bad, but softer. You don't need a ship to hear you. You aren't broadcasting the 30 hearts, just one. Unchain me and I will sing to you every day. You will hear speech, and I will feel the water. We can talk daily. You will hear. You flip your tail around, show off the rope made of kelp and coral and rusted chains. He reaches for a knife, and in his boot, slashes at the kelp, stomps on the coral, and there's enough gap in the chain for you to wiggle free. He looks at you, as if you're his heart's desire, and it's true. You have not stopped singing that. But you have your own desires too. Freedom and food. And now you have both. So um, that's story one called Siren Screech. I have another one for you called A Blacksmith's Heart. Before you go too far, your sure. S's are peaking. You might want to... Okay. adjust your Thank mic you. a little bit i can you do that in zoom uh, are, what kind of mic are you using i'm not using a mic at all oh, okay then i don't know how to suggest that but you yeah your s's be be a little bit more careful with your s's will do thank you okay um a blacksmith's heart conscripted men have a low survival rate 
We knew this when the Duke rode into town to make the announcement. All able-bodied men, those aged 16 and up, are to join the king in defending the kingdom. The, roar, the war was on the other side of the kingdom, so he was okay leaving me. A raid on our town was unlikely. Our food stores for winter might be lower, but not dangerously low. He had other worries. If I don't come back, how will you pay off the smithy? How will you buy bread? I know Gertrude at the bakery, I told him, and I'll pay off the smithy with my own work. He smiled at me, brushing a tight curl behind my ear. I'm sure you could. But I don't want to, I said, curling into his chest. So come back. I spent every day in the smithy, touching his tools. He taught me basic items before, nails and horseshoes. And when Gertrude needed to fix a shelf in the bakery, she learned how to hammer using the nails I struggled to make on my own. There were no men. We had to do it ourselves. Nails and horseshoes turned into door handles and shelf brackets. But then came the announcement of the war's end, of our victory, and the slow trickle of men back to town. A third returned, but not my husband. I couldn't bother with the fires or bellows. I couldn't bother with eating. Gertrude knocked on my door, soft and then hard enough to swing it inward. She had a note for me, a reminder of payment for the smithy, and I remember telling my husband I'd pay it off with my own hands. It was one of the last things I said to him. It was something I'd make true. That night, I made my first sword. I took the weight of my loneliness and poured it into a broadsword. I took the emptiness of my house and compressed it into a spike hilt. The sharp pain of the void in my chest became the sword's edge, the coldness of our bed, the sting it gave when I cut my finger testing it. It was large and cold and heavy. It was sharp and uneven and completely unusable, poorly balanced in weight and emotion. I called it the sword of darkness. I couldn't make another sword. I'd hammered out my grief, but it was there, and swords had been his specialty. I returned to household items, plain and useful, until I noticed someone new in town. I looked down the street as I began my walk to Gertrude's bakery, still run by her as her husband returned missing a hand, and saw a woman on the hills outside of town. She stood there in the dawn light, looking down on our town, and something in my chest lurched. She was beautiful, she was dainty, she was powerful. She started walking down the path to town and I lost her behind the roof. I don't remember what I said that morning to Gertrude, but she will happily tell you how I came up to her window to say, July is a great month with a dopey smile. The woman wouldn't leave my head and I found myself heating metal for a second sword. I tempered the steel so it reminded me of the flash of a million light on her brown hair. The thick, heavy pommel was my suddenly beating heart, stretching toward a delicate guard. The faint hope that I might love again one day, if other people were catching my eye, became its barely there fuller. It wasn't a sword to wield damage on the battlefield, the pommel a better bludgeon than the sword's ability to cut. I'd kept the edges thick, uncertain about what the sword would do, uncertain about what to do with a beating heart. When that woman turned up at the smithy two days later, hoping to have her dagger sharpened, I gave her the sword and said, the sword of July red morning, I told her, it's more art than anything, but I want you to have it. You're really giving me this? She asked. I thought of you while making it and no one around here will buy it. There are better sword makers a half day's ride to the south but I'm the blacksmith for you if you want anything else. How about you? She asked. Her kiss was as fine as her hair. The night before my second wedding, I wielded the hammer and anvil a third time. I'd found love again, and it was energizing. My joy made the sword gleam. The warm leather of the grip came from her hand and mine. And because I knew life always had something good waiting for me, the sword edge remained blunt. Joy doesn't cut, even if the memory of my husband bruised me that day. The sword of light, I called it. I hung it up on my wall, all of the swords arranged point down. I show off my new ring to any visitor, wedged against my first, fired clay and hammered iron, 
love for me on display to the world. But I keep my sword collection private for me and Lucille. They are private, battered emotions, the cut of grief, the uncertain weight of hope, the warmth of a second love. I can love, I can lose, and I can love again. All right. Thank you all. So those are two of the nearly 20 stories that I have in my fantasy collection coming out in two weeks on October 10th. Uh, you can go ahead and order it from Amazon if you're curious. And then, of course, the story, same question for you, uh, for, for both of them. Where do they go from here? Um, In this specific story? Yeah. Okay, this story is complete, so it's a it's okay. kind of fiction. Yeah, so, but Sorry. they do end up happily ever met, you know, ever after at the end of it, just living their lives. Okay. And where did you get the idea for these? Um, Actually, online writing groups. Um, so as well as some of my own experiences, when I was younger, I did some volunteering for a, a historical blacksmith shop and I found it so cool. So I always knew that I had to write a little bit about it. And I've got like a few like decorative elements that hang in my bathroom. Um, so, so, um, it, uh, Lisa, uh, wants to know what's your favorite part of writing. This is for both of you. Um, I like the discovery aspect of it. I don't really know where a story is going until I'm writing it. Um, so discovering it as I go along is what brings me back to the craft every time. Storm? Um, I like disappearing into another world that um, I, even if it's not utopian, even if it has the same sort, so, same sort of issues as our world, isn't our world. So um, yeah, I, I enjoy that. I always like to ask, what's your uh, the, the least favorite and or hardest part of writing for you both? Um, I went first before. You can go first this time, Storm. Um, that, well, yeah, you, would, you would ask that, I think, before I read and I was talking about the time issue. But then once I'm actually sitting down writing, um, I don't know. I think point of view, it can be challenging making the the narration around the different characters sound different enough when I'm, I'm writing like mid-range to close third person with a dual point of view, um, making sure those chapters sound different. My background is doing really weird things, so I will change that. Um, I will struggle, especially in first drafts with internal consistency because I discover the story as I go along. I also often discover the world building. <laughs> So I might forget what I put in for like right, how the magic right. system works in chapter three. And then, you know, things come up later. I'm like, oh, hmm, how how did I say that goes? I have to do a lot of back and forth in my documents. Um, so. Well, that leads to the next question. You know, the 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 on, uh, ongoing joke, there are two types of writers, pantsers and plotters. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Um, like I said before, I tend to imagine myself as a discovery writer so someplace in between i tend to have a very loose outline i'll usually have like an arc in mind so let's say i want this character to start here and end there um but that's pretty much all i have and then i just go for it storm i'm surprisingly a plotter because i'm a kind of pantser in life um <laughs> but yeah i my i use um i use scrivener and i will do a whole beat sheet structure with with you know a different little document for each beat and then fill it in as i'm writing and there will be some things that come up as um as unexpected some discovery that happens but i i don't do the here's the blank page and where is the story going to take me um i i think that's a very cool phenomenon to do that but i for, for me, it's like, I like to have that, I like to have that structure and then that feeling that I'm just, that I'm filling it in, I'm, I'm coloring it in, I've got the outline there and I'm coloring it in now, um, rather than a completely blank canvas, which would be a little more intimidating for me. One of the things I like to ask writers, it's kind of a writer's block question, but not quite, um, burnout. How do you, what do you do to kind of refill your creative well? Um, how do you keep yourself from make? How do you keep yourself from having fun rather than it being quote unquote just a job? Because yes, it is work, but at the same time, if you're not having fun, there's loads easier of things to do. <laughs> um, uh, I found the the, uh, the the community aspect of it really helps. I've gotten involved with GCLS, the Golden Crown Literary Society for Sapphic 
um, and women loving women writers and books and writers of those books, even if they are not themselves in that identity. Um, and I'm doing the Writing Academy class and that really tremendously, you know, fills up the picture every week. So at this point, this is really something very, very new and exciting to me. I'm a new writer, um, uh, professionally at least. I've been writing my entire life, but trying to do it as a career piece is new to me. So I'm not yet in a position where I am facing the issue of burnout. I am having the issue of often feeling quite overwhelmed and by, by the time factor and everything else, but writing is still very new and exciting, fortunately. Yeah, um, burnout is a thing. I've been publishing since 2011, so not very long, but um, there's always that idea, like when you're trying to make a business and suddenly you get very overwhelmed, like I have to produce at such a speed, I have to not just write, I have to like make a cover and a marketing plan. And uh, I feel like a lot of burnout comes not just from the writing aspect of it, but everything that goes involved in publishing. Um, I deal with it two ways. One year, I actually like, um, I'm, I'm pretty involved in nano. So when you're for nano, I was just like, I'm not going to write. I'm just going to spend 50 hours brainstorming new ideas. Um, so it was actually really nice because I felt like the more I started thinking about things, the easier it was for me to come up with like different worlds and different characters. And I just kind of got back into that creative mindset by the end of the month, which was really nice. Um, the other thing is uh, fan fiction. <laughs> um, fan fiction is just a type of writing where there is no profit involved at all. It is sheer enjoyment for both a write from a writing standpoint and from a consuming reading standpoint. Um, you're always, or you know, like 80, 90% of the time, you're going to get positive feedback from the community. And that is really what helps you overcome burnout is knowing that your writing is appreciated. Um, so writing in a fun space where people are enjoying it always helps me feel better. Storm also mentioned fanfic. Do you have a particular um, media that you write for? Or... Um, I just I'd mentioned go... the Star Trek DS9. I'm everywhere. <laughs> like, I'm really bad. I probably have like 200 fix on AO3 alone. Like, I'm pretty prolific and I'm, I write way more fan fiction than I write original stuff, sadly. Um, but my current fandoms, I would say that I have active stories for um, are BBC Merlin um, and also, um, it's so old, the original anime for Yu Gi Oh! Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, this is a kind of a question for both, but it's going to be reversed. For you, why fantasy versus science fiction? For me? For Gwen, yeah. Okay, so I tend to, I've written both, but I have find that fantasy is where I keep falling into. Like I do also have a short story collection that's primarily um, science fiction and contemporary. But ever since I was little, I have found myself fascinated with myths. I think it comes from the fact that I'm Greek. So like Zeus, Athena, all of that stuff is very, I was just surrounded by it from a very young age. I was connected with it. Um, and then um, Arthurian legends are another thing that I, always my mind keeps pinging on. And so I fall back into fantasy over and over again, though I frequently do write some science fiction flash and I will read in the genre as well. Storm, why do you uh, write, uh, you know, you may write both, but why science fiction over fantasy? Um, I like the idea of reality just once removed, like that science fiction is in, in what our current reality can imagine and can understand. And I like the, um, the constraints of that, the way that um, sort of writing within the limits. And I write um, near future science fiction. So the science in it is like, I don't have faster than light travel. I don't have things that we currently don't understand as possible. Um, and although I was more of a humanities person in school, I have enough uh, of a natural interest in science and curiosity in science that I find it fun to do the research for science fiction. Great, another question for both of you. Um, I'll, Storm, you can go first. Um, your your procedure, you mentioned you're a teacher, which you mm -hmm. know, as a daughter of a teacher, give you a hand clap for that because I know it's that is a <laughs> job in and of itself. Uh, even if it wasn't for that, um, 
do you uh, try and write like every morning, every day? You said weekends primarily, but weekends. I mean like mornings, afternoons. Do you have um, a particular schedule? We uh, weekend afternoon and evening. I usually get like a, a good long session in on Friday, on Saturday afternoon or evening, and then on Sunday afternoon. And lately, I've been sometimes I will write on weeknight evenings or after, but I can't count on it. Um, so I I've been working very hard to make sure that I'm not taking home work from work because that is always the the challenge in teaching that it, to try to make it not come home with me so that I can so that I know that from when I leave the building on Friday to when I walk in, back into the building on Monday um it's my time to write and and also you know whatever else comes up on the weekends but that that's where it is right now just making weekends as dedicating for dedicated for as much writing work as I can get done and then anything I can get done during weeknights is bonus and then Gwen, your writing procedure, talk a little bit. Um, it, unfortunately, I usually have the biggest writing bug when it's like during my nine to five <laughs> because I'm in front of a laptop. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I might have like 20 minutes. Let me like pull up my document in Dropbox. So I've done more of that than I should have, I will admit um it's just easier because then I'm kind of in this productivity mindset already versus when I get home I really you know like in the evenings I'm like okay I gotta make dinner maybe I gotta you know clean the floors vacuum any of that type of stuff so I do have um a regular weekday write time on but it's because my writers group will meet and so um there's several of us who will get together in a community space either on zoom or maybe like a local Panera and we'll just write for three hours which is really nice Otherwise, it is typically weekends, um, and I feel like I have to leave my space because in my space, I, like, want to do chores or I want to just spend too much time working on AO3. Like, I feel like I need to have a mini commute so I can put my mind in a mindset of, okay, time to be business or writer Gwen for the next few hours, and I'll trip down to a cafe. And then for, for both of you, do you try and write like to a specific word amount? Do you just write till the idea stops? Do you have a specific time limit? That kind of thing. Uh, uh, Gwen, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I usually just write until, um, like if it's, if it's my weekday write session, it's just that three hours that we have. So when I'm done, I'm done. If it's a weekend, um, it depends on what I'm doing. If it's a writing session, it'll just kind of like write until my laptop battery dies. Um, if instead what I'm trying to do is not like writing, but like business aspects of it, like let's design a cover or let's get some social media posts out, then I'll have a task list. And I try to get the task list done first. And Storm? I, I set a word count goal. Um, I, I do uh, sessions in Scrivener. I'll hit, you know, start a new session. Um, my current session goal is set at a thousand, but I'm going to up that because I usually end up trying to write to like 2000. So I'll think back, I'll make the goal 1500. And yeah, I've, I've found that I need, I need that external structure um, to help me do enough and also to stop it from turning into really marathon writing sessions that take me away from everything else that needs to be happening in life so just to have it be like and and okay I I can sit down and I can start this because and not worry that I'm not going to look up from my computer for eight hours because I'm keeping track of a word count which Gwen do you also use Scrivener or do you use something else I I don't know if old school is the right term, but like I just use Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. um, a Scrivener is not too complicated for me, but it doesn't match my for like my style of writing. Like Stormy mentioned that you do a lot of planning. And so Scrivener has mm -hmm. a lot of great tools for that. But as someone who just sits down and writes chronologically and I'm developing the story as I go, mm -hmm. I just need a blank right. sheet. That's all. <laughs> And then if you could travel in time, there's your, your science for you, um, and meet yourself when you were first starting out as a writer, what would be the one thing you would tell yourself in terms of tips? Uh, Gwen, why don't you go first? Um, oddly enough, I would tell myself to ignore my father. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that. Storm? 
I might give myself the same advice. I kind of think of like, I, I had a first start for starting out as a writer when I was in college and I was studying creative writing and I was applying for MFA programs and I had a lot of family pressure to do something practical that would earn me a, write it, a living and that I could write in the evenings. And that turned out to not really be as realistic as people like my dad thought it would be. Um, and I ended up not writing for 20 years as as a result and then starting again um and if i were so i think i might if there's a whole i feel like i do feel like there's an entire alternate me who had that first start and continued instead of having it be a false start and then picked it up again later if i were going back and talking to me from the start from this start of this path i think i would just say that this is awesome it's great that you're back it is not too late you can do it so and then if the, somebody came to you and asked for writing advice what would be what would be the the first thing that came to your mind a storm don't be afraid of it it it's it is something that that you can do you don't need to be um it's not magic you don't need to to be scared away from it and gwen um start with a type of story that you consume a lot because you probably intrinsically know the types of characters and the tropes and the structures of those stories. And so it'll be the easiest thing to start writing. Now we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, if we, we have one person in the room, if they have any questions, feel free to go. I can keep going. But um, any final thoughts uh, as well as where people can find you, Gwen? I see you have your link tree up there, but feel free to uh, say say all the uh, the various areas that you're at. Uh, Gwen, you can go first. Any yeah, last thoughts so or where can people can find you? So you can find me around most social media. I don't have Facebook, but you'll find me on Blue Sky, Instagram, uh, TikTok, Tumblr, actually. That's where I tend to do a lot of my hangouts, and I know that's unusual. <laughs> um, but um, it tends to be a really good, actually, writing community, especially for short fiction. It's easy to share stuff there. Um, I also have a website, guentelios.com, and you can find me, of course, on Amazon and Goodreads. And then Storm, any last thoughts and or where people can find you? Um, Amazon, Goodreads, uh, Blue Sky is my my big one lately. Facebook, I'm on there as SK Wood. Um, Twitter, the site formerly known as Twitter was where I spent most of my social media time, but now that's changing to Blue Sky. Great. Well, I'm good. we have seven more minutes, so I'll keep asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> um in terms of editing, do you find yourself editing as you write or do you try and save that all for later? Um, either of you can answer or both. Um, editing as I write is a kind of habit I'm trying to get out of because I I, I like write, trying to write clean the first time, but I realized how much it was slowing myself down. So I make a real effort now not to edit when I write. Part of the reason, you know, I feel like an ad for Scrivener right now, but part of the reason I do enjoy it is because I'm opening the next thing that I'm, because I'm only opening the thing I'm working on. It helps me avoid the temptation. When I had everything in one document, it was so tempting to just open every time and then go right back to the beginning and edit and spend an hour editing before I even got any fresh content down. So I'm trying to break the habit of editing while I write so that I can work faster and then I can have more like distinct drafts where I edit instead of having it be a constant editing process. Yeah. Um, I find that I can't edit as I go. As I mentioned before, I'm really discovering the story as I'm writing it. So I don't know what's there until I finish. Um, so that means I usually have to do a lot of heavy editing, I will admit, um, especially in longer works. I tend to be cleaner if I'm doing shorter stories, but if it's anything like I have a few novelettes, novellas, and one novel, like that novel had so many pass-throughs, like I did huge structural changes to it, but it's because when I finished draft one, I suddenly know how the story is going to end. I have a better handle of the characters, and then I have to do all the editing from, you know, the first half of it to make it align and then um in terms of world building what do you find is the how much of it do you keep to the page and how much do you just write it somewhere else just so you have it and, and you know how do you keep it from being how do you keep yourself from overwhelming your audience with your world um storm you go first 
Uh, I will do some writing on other documents and I will do a lot just in my mind, kind of. And then trying, and then I try to, to limit, okay, what, what does the reader need to know? And what does, what does my character need to think about? Um, and to, um, especially with the sci-fi aspects, like I couldn't explain to somebody how Zoom works right now, even though I'm using it. And my middle school station, space station teacher couldn't really explain spin gravity, even though it's what's holding her in place. So I try to, to keep the to make, have a very fully developed world in my head, which I enjoy to do, uh, doing anyway. I find that really pleasurable part of the writing, but then to keep it to just what's necessary for the story. Um, for me, it depends on the length of the story. If it's really large, I tend to have like a separate document for world building. So I do have a science fiction novel that we'll see if I ever release it. But like, I have like blueprints for this spaceship. I have like laws and regulations, like all of this stuff for it. Um, I have like, I dabbled in conlag for a while. So like I developed a language for another fantasy thing. So like I can get deep into that. But when I'm doing um, short fiction, I find that it's really just staying in my head. Um, and sometimes I hope that my readers will pick up on it. They don't always like see the little in between kind of things um but yeah so a combination and then um who would you say are your biggest influences in terms of writing who do you tend to go to when you want to refill that creative well um why don't you go first so i have two at the moment i would say um one is rick riordan um i know that he does a lot of middle grade but i actually discovered him when I was in my late 20s. Um, so I like how he has quite a variety of different mythologies, diverse characters, and that's always been like a, inspiring to me. So I like going back to him from time to time. I also really like Shauna McGuire, um, specifically her novellas. Um, her books tend to be, um, I like reading them, but I feel like her novellas are more along the lines in terms of style and vibe that I tend to write. Um, so I'll connect with those more. Who is also on Tumblr. <laughs> yes, I am aware. <laughs> Neil uh, Gaiman's there too. Yes, yes. So. And, he, and he recently just offered to, to put David Tennant on fire for people. <laughs> right? I mean, so like, there's like, Gwen is there too. Diane Duane is also yep, a yeah, yeah. So Diane Duane is someone that was like very instrumental to me when I was a child, but I wouldn't say she's a current creative focus. And then Storm? Um, growing up, Ursula Le Guin and a lot of the like Isaac Asimov classic sci-fi was a thing I nerded out to as a child. Um, when I was a younger adult, Margaret Atwood was a big influence, um, even though she doesn't claim sci-fi. Um, the Mad Adam trilogy was very influential on me. Um, currently, I'm on a big Elizabeth Bear kick. I absolutely love her white space um, world, and I love the Argelum series if, um, for, for queer sci-fi. It's great. But not Elizabeth Bear. Just, it's, it's a... And then we got one more minute, so any last thoughts? Anyone? Free for all. <laughs> Thanks for such great questions. Oh, well, yeah. uh, as I mentioned, today is International Podcast Day, and I do have a podcast myself where I interview geeky people about geeky things. I'm sorry if they seem to be somewhat uh, redundant questions. My my focus is somewhat split, uh, trying to keep track of everything else. But um, other than that, I think we can uh, feel free to keep the discussion going on the Discord. Uh, we have a self-promotion tab for both of you. Feel free to put in your various links as to where people can find you as well as the readings and if either of you have a panel later like break a leg if you haven't please enjoy yeah. the rest of the conference all right thank you no,